Welcome, everybody, to another True Potential Do More With Your Money podcast. This is episode Clickety Click 66, and we're recording this on Friday, the 30th of April. And today, we're going to be talking about Britain and everything that's good about it. In particular, we're going to be talking about the British economy, still the fifth largest in the world. And as Hugh Grant once said, we may be a small country, but we are a great one too. And we've got the best of British joining us today on the podcast. We've got Jeff Casson. Mark Henderson's here, Daniel Harrison's back, and we're joined by David Harrison as well. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Could I, could I just kick off by asking you, before we get into Mark's uh, update, uh, what is your favourite thing about Britain? And I'm going to come to you first, Mark. I think it's it's podcast hosts who get the order wrong, Peter, because um, Jeff's <laughs> doing the, the, the market update. Yeah, that's what you think. <laughs> It'll be a very quick session, Peter. Uh, Okay, so podcasts. Uh, Daniel, let's come to you. I don't don't know. British British Bulldogs. Oh, right. Yes. I've seen a few. I've seen a few of those before on nights out. Um, Jeff, (laughs) Jeff, what is your favourite thing about Britain? And if you want to, you can narrow it down to Scotland if you must. Oh, if I must, I'll, I'll keep it. I'll keep it broader with a, a good English and cooked breakfast that cr- cuts across all all four of the the regions. Excellent, David. Don't let us down. That was hugely diplomatic by Jeff. There, I just you you would have thought that he at some point in time him or somebody very close to him been involved in the peace process for three hundred years. <laughs> An English breakfast just cuts across all four countries <laughs> like hell, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like haggis. Also. <laughs> what, what do I like about what, what was the question? <laughs> What's your favorite thing about Britain? All right, um, uh, um, memory loss, I think. Good, yeah, <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, uh, there's so many things, Peter. I'm going to be smarmy here. There actually are so many things, it's hard to name one. Well, I'm going to go for a pint in a beer garden since we're allowed to do that again. I also think people well, who Don't do that until that you finish in... this. Oh, well, no. Well, I've already been down this oh, you morning. Mean, you meant by, I'm going to go for a pint in a beer garden, you're going to go for that as the answer, not you're going to go for a pint in a beer garden. Uh, that's my favourite thing about Britain, David. Being allowed to do it again, it was a, it was it was meant to be my way of um, making a funny joke about us being out of lockdown and having a pint again. But it's perhaps a bit too early for that kind of highbrow comedy. What's I, good though I, is that we've all I turned up that... in our team colours. Have we noticed that yeah. we've all turned up on brand? That's pretty and good. Brand, brand. Go on, should we talk about uh, Mark's uh, markets? Mark's markets read by Jeff today, apparently. But uh, <laughs> gents, when I was looking at the uh, the markets last night and of it this morning as well, I noticed lots of green, uh, which tends to be a good sign. But please, Jeff, do give us some more colour. No, you're right. Green is good, and it's been a, a green a green week and a, and a green month for for markets, which has been been really good to see. Um, I suppose this week and maybe last week as well, it's all been about results and getting quarterly results from from companies. So it's always quite hard to to take sort of a discernible trend from from markets when you've got results season ongoing. But what can you really see this week and it's been strength from across the piece with the large cap technology companies in the US delivering really strong results, probably defying a little bit of expectation where some had been suggesting that they might start to see a bit of a slowdown as as economies recover. Interesting to see within those advertising really strong. So if you look at Alphabet, Google's parent company, look at some of the the other businesses that are exposed to those advertising trends, really seeing businesses want to advertise more as as the economy reopens. So continuing to use other parts of of those businesses um, that maybe didn't benefit to the same extent through lockdown. So that very, very clear and coming through. But then just looking across other sectors, um, thinking about financials here in the, the UK with good numbers from from Lloyd's um, in the US, a lot of the banks there are reporting, releasing a lot of the, the reserves that they set aside last year for the problems that may or may not come from, from COVID-19 and that's allowed them to, to deliver good, good growth. I think the one thing about banks that's maybe been a bit um, disappointing is just this, and it maybe feeds into something that we'll come on and, and talk to, just the the amount of cash that the consumer has and that businesses have they're not borrowing 
and they need banks need businesses to borrow to to really drive their their earnings and that's not not coming through as yet so the consumer's got a lot of cash in the on their balance sheet and so so do businesses so that's one thing that i think we need to 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 watch just over the next number of quarters to see that coming through within the financial sector because that will be important for for the the earnings trajectory of banks going forward and that'll be a sign of you know, normal in inverted commas uh, trends coming back into to the market i think the other thing that's really noticeable in in results is what we hear about inflation a topic that we've touched on on a, on a few of these podcasts and in our morning markets videos where businesses are seeing a bit of pressure from rising input costs so if we look at industrial metals they have all continued to to move to to highs coppers at a 25 year high this week um combination of demand but also some of the challenges of production last year because of of covid so that that inflation impulse is there and one of the areas that i'm sure everybody has has, has probably read about is just the the real challenge with with chips and maybe fish and chips is something that we'd all associate with being being sort of more of a, a british thing but anyway it's the it's the chips that go in the the computers and cars and washing machines everything is is having a having a challenge at, at this point in time so there is one um area that is is common to to many different sectors that, that there is a bit of pressure uh, coming through so auto companies this week in particular really highlighting uh, some of the challenges they are having there i think the other things just to touch on from this week we had us gdp numbers exceptionally good we thought they would and we knew they would be good looking at just the the monthly build of those but growth in the us gdp 6.4 percent on an annualized basis we've also seen very strong uh, retail activity in the us as people have spent a large proportion of the 1400 dollar uh, stimulus check so that has been a, a strong contributor to to us gdp if we think about the components of gdp consumption itself was up some 10 percent so that was a real driver of that coming through so as the economy has reopened in the us consumption has has started to, to to rebound i think then just the other thing that has been evident over the the course of the month and and and, and the week as well as just been that reversal in, in in currency markets we we saw over the first um number of months the first quarter really of this year strength of the us dollar that's reversed um over the course of april and we've started to to see emerging markets um, emerging market debt those areas start to perform a little bit better over over the course of of the month but many many things ongoing with the fed um this week as well and i do think this is is something to to continue to monitor going forward because we've got exceptionally accommodative monetary and, and uh, even increased fiscal support coming through in in the us and by that i mean just government spending so if we look at what what biden announced with his, his 100 day um program last two nights ago in, in congress another um support package to the tune of 1.9 trillion this time on social care education health care funded by taxation and it will be funded by increases at both the corporate level but also um at, at a at a consumer level and particularly those those wealthier individuals in the, in the us so again a, a trend that the market is is looking through at this point in time in terms of increasing corporate tax rates but something that that certainly merits monitoring going forward because you know, where the us is led will other will other countries follow we've already seen the uk corporate tax rate increase as well and there is a a, a quid pro quo with that you as you increase that tax rate the 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 incentive to invest maybe becomes slightly less so there's a curve of balance to be to be struck here but there does seem to be a, a bit of a change ongoing in in u.s policy u.s policy direction but i'll maybe leave it there because there's there's quite a lot there already well i was just going to pick up on on that uh, jeff because and do a couple of plugs if i can because you mentioned one of them uh, morning markets that of course you do in the team uh, every weekday morning so just for our uh, listeners and viewers if you want to get more of that kind of insight from Jeff and his team uh, then make sure you just check out our U YouTube channel if you subscribe to it you'll not miss a beat and uh, 
there's a there's a very good punchy couple of minutes worth every morning, isn't there, Jeff, from the team uh, with with what's happening on the markets, which is well worth well worth tuning into. And also um, thinking of the work that you've been doing, Mark and Jeff, as well over the last few weeks on True Insight. This is the regular uh, quarterly magazine that the team produce. Uh, that's due to land on doorsteps any any day now as well, if it hasn't already. So there's a lot of content in there around looking, well, looking back on the last quarter, but importantly, looking ahead as well and getting into the detail on a couple of interesting topics, which I won't spoil by, by uh, mentioning now, but just keep an eye out for that if you're uh, receiving a copy of that in the post. Um, David, I wanted to, I mentioned in the introduction before that um, we are, Britain is still the fifth largest economy in the world, and we'll get on to some of the why we're talking about the British economy in a moment. It'll become very obvious as we go on with the podcast. By the way, I feel like I should have had a union jack just about here, like a kind of government minister, a huge overly oversized union jack, but I couldn't quite find one in the garage, but I'll, I'll keep looking. I'm sure you've got one, David, on top of the house. You could have brought down. Um, but uh, we, we talked about Britain being this fifth largest economy, and perhaps that's something which not a lot of people acknowledge or don't quite know what that means, but it's worth bearing out, isn't it? It's... Well, in dollar terms, our uh, economy is about 3.1, 3.2 trillion. I think Jeff will probably either nod or shake his head at that figure, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a big figure. Um, so, and we have to remember, I think, according to the Times last year, I think they did a, an article that I read in about December last year, mm. Peter, that we leapfrogged, if you like, uh, India, who are obviously a very populous uh, country. Um, and they reckon that uh, Britain will continue that growth, although India will come back. I think uh, India is getting, like a lot of countries, uh, they've been affected by the pandemic. But I would doubt if they've been affected that much. I think they're already slowing down, but they will begin to build again. Um, the, uh, the top five uh, economies in the world, I think everybody will know this, the US, China, Japan, Germany, um, Britain, stroke, India, uh, and then France. But it looks, I mean, the, the trends are there. The, the, you know, it, I think it's foolish to to project things forever ahead. But if you're using things like demography, which is quite a steady uh, indicator and populations and so on and so forth, which, which uh, tend to drive these things quite strongly, um, then we're set, you know, for quite a good... Uh, journey over the next few years. We'll pull away from France. I mean, I think every pundit uh, agrees on that. That uh, The French throughout history, by the way, have suffered from being um, French, um, uh, which means that nobody likes them uh, apart from French people. Nobody understands them apart from French people. But they have always had a problem with population. Bear in mind that they are not necessarily as urban as we are. So when you get growth in population, it tends to be urban rather than in the countryside. And they, uh, in you know, since the sort of century before last, um, slowed down dramatically um, and always feared Germany and other countries which were growing quite quickly population. The population in Britain would have been much, much bigger if we hadn't exported um, lots and lots of our people to far from places such as Northern Ireland and those kind of outposts of uh, colonialism. Um, so, it, and, and the experiment didn't work too well there, but we did okay in America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and, and other places. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, the, we it's easy for us to just take for granted, Peter, which is what I think most of us do. We take for granted what we've got here. Um, uh, and it's wrong to do so, and it's also wrong to listen too much to people who criticize us internally. Um, because, you, you know, there are hundreds of worse off countries in the world, worse places to grow up. Um, mm. This is a fabulous place to grow up. And I mean, when, when, I, when you asked a really good question, what, what is it like about Britain, uh, you know, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, to give it its straight title? Um, I think humor is, I mean, people might not agree with me my humor but um i think people in britain are humorous in comparison with uh, others i told a lady yesterday she's danish and she and, and uh, people are saying she's quite abrupt but she was nice but she 
abrupt. We've got a different, you know, we've worked with a German uh, a guy in the past and he's, he, you know, he thought he was humorous. He'd giggle away like a, like a, a giggling German, but there was nothing funny about what he was, but he just thought it was just a different sense of humor. We've got a deep sense of irony. We take, I think the best humor, you sort of Billy Conley type of humor, where you're taking the mick out of yourself rather than out of somebody else. And I think that's quite a gentle and clever humour that I wouldn't say it's particular just to Britain, um, uh, you know, but it's it's quite distinctively, in many ways, British. Um, you know, not, not many people can copy that. I think you had a lifetime of growing up with people taking the mickey out of you, as, as, as Mark would well know. <laughs> what does he mean, Mark? I have absolutely no idea, Peter. I don't know. <laughs> we know you do. Daniel, David's just been talking there about, um, if you like, what it's like to be British and live in Britain. But can you just talk a bit about what it's like to, to run a business in Britain? I mean, the conscious, perhaps, you know, you probably have to have several others around the world to be able to do a comparison. But you are sitting in a, a, a hugely, you know, very modern, beautiful building that you've just invested some money in, in you know, really bringing into the next decade, if you like, not even bringing up to date, but bringing it into the next decade and running a very successful business. What does Britain, what do we do well in this country in terms of business and, and running businesses um, in your view? What are we good at? What are we not so good at? I think that the, the first bit David mentioned, what, what, what David mentioned was about the sense of humour. And that's a big part of actually the workforce, our true potential as well. We've, we've had everybody in over the last two weeks for get a back to work day, a tour of the new office and things like that. And it's been a lot of fun. Um, our staff, I, I don't just think it's our staff, I don't think it's unique to us. I think it's exactly what David says. It, that sense of humour, um, and that's been missing. It, it's hard to do that. It's hard to be informal and spontaneous over over calls like, like this. So it's been lovely to hear all of the normal daft jokes and, and things haven't evolved over the last 14 months. It's still the same silly gags and, and nonsense going on. So I think that's that's been wonderful uh, to, to, to have that back at true potential of, of the last two weeks. I think what else do we bring? I think it, it's what I do like about, I know it's, I've been slightly silly at the start when I said, what did I like? And I, I like British Bulldogs and things. I, I like the diversity of what goes on actually in the United Kingdom. Um, the, the range of people, the, the, the mix, um, everything from kind of Geordies across to Scots to Northern Irish and, and, and everything in between. We're all slightly different. It's not say like, I don't think it's like it is in say the United States, where I think a lot of Americans along the East Coast are very similar, you know, and obviously in the West Coast, they're, they're a wee bit different. But when you look at that landmass, I always, I always think Americans are a bit vanilla, uh, for, for instance, and, and quite samey. Whereas here, there's a world of difference between uh, somebody from the Northeast, from, from say Newcastle, uh, as what there is from Yorkshire, as what there is from Manchester, as what there is, you know, from Bristol. Uh, etc. I think so. You get that brilliant diversity with, 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 within here, which actually comes across with the type of people we work with as well. And the second thing I think adding to that diversity and that culture as well is I think we've, we've got a good, a fantastic background or pedigree in this country of bringing people in from outside the United Kingdom to work for us. So we're privileged actually. We, we work with people from around the world who, who are in this, this building as well. And they offer something a bit different as well. So like David was saying, maybe with the, the Danish lady, yes, but he comes across as abrupt or, or what have you, but it brings us it brings a different perspective uh in, into the workforce as, as well. So I could probably go on and on, Peter, about the, the culture mm -hmm. side of things, but I think that's what makes that's what makes it fun being a boss in, in the UK is actually all of the different characters and personalities which which you come yeah. across with every day. It's a, good, it's a great point. Yeah, we mentioned the the office there that you're in as well. And uh, are we, when are we going to get a tour of it, Daniel? Because I know our audience is. We've heard, you know, I heard on the podcast last week and the week before that, the team were talking about it. But uh, we're, I know our, I know our viewers are desperate to get a little glimpse of this. I just, I just I can walk the camera around now, Peter. We could just scrap the podcast and I'll just give it, give everybody a tour. <laughs> give it, give it a tour. 
Well, I yeah. think you should. I think you should. I think we should do a little, a little quick wander around while we're ch- while we're chatting, and you can just talk us around. Maybe just the floor you're on. Give us a sneak preview. Go on. Well, it's it's empty. It's the problem, Peter. I think it's just me and Mark Henderson walking around. So for those who can't see, I'm on the uh, first floor. Um, so let's see. This is normally where the staff will be sat, but we're having a quieter day today. And if I walk along this way, I come and see a special guest. That oh, is, this is confusing. That's the back of Mark's head. <laughs> from from there as well. Um, so so yeah, but look, Peter, I think we'll, I think we're planned on on, on making a couple of video, video tours and things to actually send to our clients to show them around. Yeah. Sort of well, let Mark. He's trying well. to get out of it. Yeah. Well, it's a good sneak preview. That was that was all we needed. It was a little bit of a uh, a sight of the back of Mark's head. That's that was good enough for me. So uh, thank you for that. Yes, just look, as you say. See, if I if I was a client, Peter, and I saw that, I'd be really worried because I'd be thinking, "Where's my money? Where's it's just money? two blokes in an empty building." <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it looks, we don't we don't spend fortunes like on John staff, Lewis. David. Right? <laughs> it looks like John Lewis. <laughs> All it requires is a creepy lawyer trying to buy some wallpaper in the corner and pretending he's, he's interesting. No. So you're always, you're always, David, you're always sell the sizzle, not the sausage. So I'm just, I'm just going <laughs> to... There's, there's another British thing, a British banger, Peter. Oh, yeah, me. <laughs> like a Robin Reliant, that kind of British banger. <laughs> um, Mark. We've seen the back of your head. Let's talk to the front of it. So let's, we should talk about the reason, the reason we are talking about, if you like, Britain and the British economy this week. There's obviously some fairly important local elections coming up um, next week. Uh, but if I, by this time next week, we'll start to have results coming through. And the reason they're a bit more important possibly than just your local council election, which you know, turnout normally tells you, for a lot of the population, tends to go over their head. Um, but there's more... The reason these are more important, if you like, or more significant possibly, is there were no elections last year. So they've rolled last year's and this year's into one. And that means that there's more seats up for grabs. It's a bit, it's a better litmus test, if you like, of just what the public is thinking. Um, and there's a by-election just down the road in, in Hartlepool from where we're sitting, which will be a, you know, for, for a new MP. There's crime commissioners, police commissioners, there's elected mayors, London mayors up for grabs as well. So there's a lot at play. And you know, we don't need to get into the, the nitty gritty of, of those individual seats, if you like, and what it all means, because I don't think our audience would, would be too excited about that. But it is going to be a test of, if you like, the mood of the British public about whether there's been a shift. The last time we had a major election, if you like, was, of course, 2019. And that that surprised pretty much everybody, probably not least the, the current incumbent of number 10. Um, but and obviously he's had a rocky couple of weeks and, and, and there are Scottish elections as well. And we know if... Uh, if, if the SNP do particularly well, there'll be clamour for uh, independence. Although I did see a poll just yesterday that, that you know, that the yes for independence is trailing quite a far behind no. So anyway, Mark, when you put all that together, just tell us a little bit about how any of that impacts on your longer term thinking around portfolios and investment and or, or does it not? I mean, is it is it a sideshow or does it does it influence the way you think? I think, Peter, that when you say is it the sideshow, I was thinking along those lines when you're asking the question, because we, time and time again, we've seen that, that the local politics doesn't have an effect on, on the UK stock market as a whole. If you take the FTSE 100, it's a multinational index. Who gets to be police commissioner of, um, of Northumberland <laughs> is not going to move the market. And the other thing, Peter, if you think about those those people who were queuing for two hours last or last Friday or the Friday before to get into weather spoons <laughs> to, to go and cast a vote. So I think that's that, what they, they thought they were going to vote. They, <laughs> they thought it was a voting station. That that might in Hartley, be a, in Hartlepool. That's, a, that's they thought it was a, a, pull, a pulling a pulling station, not a polling station. Oh, oh no, <laughs> no. So I think, Peter, without trying to run down the, the, the importance to those who are standing to be elected of local <laughs> elections, um, I, I really don't see that it's going to have a big effect on, on the portfolios that we run because of the multinational nature of both the UK major FTSE 100, but also the portfolios themselves. 
Now, that's not to say that politics aren't important. You know, the front page of the Times this morning has shown that the Tories have still got a lead over Labour. Um, so despite the fact that there's, there's been a lot of um, negative news around particularly number 10, uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, affecting the, the mindset of the, the people who were pulled um, by the Times there. So, well, will we see a big turnout? Uh, probably not, Peter. Um, it'll be interesting just to see what does happen because it is a bit of a litmus test to see what, on the popularity of, of the current government. But, you know, as David said before, that you've had a lawyer in, in John Lewis posing in front of wallpaper. You know, people can see straight through that. And it, it's it's a bad, bad tactic. It's it's the way Marks and Spencers were wrong-footed by Aldi with Colin the Caterpillar, isn't it? You know, that, that probably gets more attention than local elections. <laughs> but, yeah. Because people simply aren't interested at this level. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the people you mentioned, or at least one of the officers, if you like, that you mentioned, I think at the last time got a turnout of 15. That's one five percent, which tells you something about whether actually that person has been democratically elected or not. <laughs> um, but, but David, I, I, just on that note, we talked about Scotland before, and and you spent a little bit of time in Scotland, and you know, and liberal clubs, and certainly mixing with Scots over the years. Um, so I've heard. Um, if the SNP do particularly well, which, you know, they are going to be the largest party, um, there will be, you know, Nicola Sturgeon will certainly use it as a chance to say, look, you know, we need to have a second independence referendum. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you've got a view on that and, and I hear it, but what are, is your view that the four nations that make up the UK are better together, that we're stronger together, that as a union we are a powerful force on the world stage? Or do you think it's more, do you think it's inevitable that Scotland goes its own way? And if it does, where does that leave Wales and Northern Ireland? The mistake that people make, Peter, is to, is to, is to even assume for a moment that we're in the slightest bit separate from each other. Okay, there's absolutely, you know, Jeff is from Northern Ireland, he's living about 35 minutes away from me in Scotland. So there, there, there you go. I was born in Wales. I live in Newcastle. You know. um, and that that sort of, so do I think of myself as British? I don't, I don't use that word. Um, in, in Jeff's homeland, they'd probably call it, I'm British, but other people would say, I'm Irish. Um, and if you want to insult either side, that's the way to do it. But in the main, certainly over the last few years, it's been a bit of a joke. And I think that, once again, this is Nicola can tap into, because um, she's, don't get me wrong, and don't be misled, she's immensely popular with the people who vote for her. It's quite a deep popularity, okay, which people in Scotland cannot understand why Boris Johnson would be popular in England. They just seem as a tough. And unfortunately, the more that gets repeated, the more they'll believe, some people will believe that. Certainly some of my, my pals would just say that. But my, those same pals would not vote for Nicola Sturgeon and independence. So they would call Boris uphill and down deal, as they say, but they wouldn't vote um, for Nicola because independence, I, I think Scotland, you know, is part of the United Kingdom. It's, it's not part of England. It's part of the United Kingdom and quite a key part because the intellect of the Scots is quite keen. It's played, and it's played a hugely formative part of the UK over the last umpteen years, but certainly two or three hundred years. You know, uh, so I, the Enlightenment and all, all of that sort of stuff, which, you know, people kind of poo poo at the moment, but that's a passing fad, the poo pooing and the the uh, virtue signaling and all that stuff, which is just utter nonsense, in my opinion, but not for the people who are doing it. They don't know why they're doing it. They're just nonsensical to begin with, right? So, but I, I think that, that for me, it would be a great shame if Scotland was to vote for independence, um, because I don't think, I know it's a long answer, Peter, I, I don't think they would, be better off as a nation 
on their own because they're too small. And there's not the diversification. You have to remember, Britain's economy is one of the most diversified in the world. OK, so yes, we got hit by pandemic, say, more than, say, our friends in Australia. But the Australian economy is by no means diversified. Yeah. Around about three quarters of our GDP is, 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 is sort of exports. When you look at when you look at that, if you break down what we export, you know, there's a lot of play about no oh, Redka, Redka steel, this that near there. Oh, fishing up in Stonehaven, you know, which is in Scotland, right? All that. They don't even move the dial. You know, I think 40, I wrote it down this morning, 45 percent. Let's have a look at what we've got here. Services. 63 billion of of our exports financial services versus 21 billion for cars. Okay, it's just there's just no comparison. The financial service, our service sector, is three quarters of our GDP. You know, so the, what we're good at services, you know, entertainment, um, retail, those sort of things. Britain is very very good at and very strong. Scotland less so. And this is the issue. When when you become that, you know, they were using North Sea oil, which I remember when I lived there. You know, that's our oil, said the Scots. You know, you know that's fine. Um, this is so. This is our money that we're giving you to subsidise you at the moment. I used to say before the, the fund began. You know, um, so that, you know you can get carried away with with this people not quite understanding what goes on. Well, what I think, uh, Peter, is we have, Danny touched on it just there, um, a hugely diversified economy. Um, and you can see when it's not diversified, how we panic. But we're living in the past in a lot of these things. And it's quite important to recognize that. You know, you, you can go on strike, but only if you're in the public sector. Right? When I was growing up, people were striking all over the place. There were unions everywhere. We don't seem to need unions as strongly as we used to need them. I think they had they played a part in stopping rapacious uh, employers and landowners in the in the distant past. But the the only purpose right now is to is to levy up wages for for public sector people, for for teachers, for others. There, we've changed dramatically as a society, and that modern society we've got now. I think it'll do really, really well if we can hold it together. But here, here's the warning shot. If we can't hold Scotland in, be under no illusion that England will power on, mm. despite everything. There's just too many people living here in England for it to be, you know, England is a large country on its own. Scotland less so, Northern Ireland even less so, Wales even less so. OK, it's the size of population which drives a lot of things. And I think there's a certain size needed. I'm not an economist, but it appears that way to me. Um, Germany, yeah. you know, it's it's miracle after the Second World War. There's a huge population in Germany. Wars were fought over size of German population, the need for the supposed need for Germans to go somewhere. The British could always go somewhere else. Uh, Germans less so. Um, when you when you look at what they did after the Second World War, that was the difference. If you look at what we're doing with Brexit, and as long as we keep it up, that's the difference. If you look at what we should be doing after a pandemic, that should be the difference. The Germans, we, we held on to and grew a welfare state for years and years and years. There was still rationing when I was a kid in the early 50s. There was no need for it. They didn't have rationing in Germany, all right? They just, they, they had a, 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 almost overnight, a modern economy, a modern market-based economy, or the British didn't. We became virtually a socialist state. And that held us back, that decade or longer, you know, held us back. And it's only since the, the 80s that we begin to, you know, emerge from that and become a much more modern democracy with a modern economy diversified away from subsidizing coal, subsidizing steel, subsidizing railways, 
wherever you get people going, you know, it's what I, I hate about governments. We'll put some money in. We'll decide what's best. If you knew what was best, you wouldn't be in government. You'd be running a business. You know, if you because I think man is, is self-determining, isn't it? You do what's best for you. OK, people say, well, no, I do the best for other people. Well, that's fine. We'll work for nothing then. You know, public sector, I, I, I fine. Work for nothing. You know, we believe in charities. Give them money to charity, but don't be paid as a charity worker. Well, it's a false so, argument anyway, David, because as, as you, certainly the three of you, senior partners and the others have proved, you can do what's best for yourself. And in doing so, benefit several hundred and probably thousands of other people as well. So it's, it's, it's not only, a... It's, Peter, I, I think it's the only system in the world that's worked over the long term. I, I'm, you know, I just know... I'm a pragmatist. It it works. That kind of thing works. And of course, you can go crazy with it. You become a, a tyrant, but you're much more likely to become a tyrant based on power. Mm. You know, much more, you know, if you look at the, the, the worry we have about China as a, as a country. Um, you worry about the boss of China becoming a little bit too, you know, you, we have seen firsthand, uh, three of us on, on the four of us on the call here. Um, when you know you get somebody from the Chinese Communist Party coming into a, uh, it, it was quite strange. I mean, I, I know um, my colleagues were there, but it was quite strange the the way the dynamics of that conference that we were in changed, and how deferential they were to somebody who was you know the local party chief, and then somebody who's like a big party chief versus the people who were really bright, really clever, and giving us insight into the world. They came along and, you know, what they said went, you know. Uh, and it, that, 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 that's why China is such a strange place. But mm. we're not China. We, we are a modern uh, country. And Brexit, final bit. Right. Can you remember when by now, OK, we would have all been standing in the queue, queuing for food and for money and all sorts because of Brexit. What a load of garbage. Right. That sort of Brexit effect just never mm. happened. We're way past it. We're growing faster than any European countries by a long way. And there's good reasons why. And we've only just begun to get the hang of this. Mm. I think the UK economy will steam ahead. I don't think, I know from what you can see, you know, we can go into the detail if you want to bore our, uh, our uh, viewers even more. But uh, no, I think. Well, uh, it's uh, also, David, we probably on the vaccine side of things as well. If we'd been still fully wedded to the EU, we'd have been in the European Medicals Agency. And you can see where you've only got to look over the channel to see where we'd probably be in terms of vaccine rollout. So, you know, yes, you can't separate bureau, that from Brexit. bureaucracy again, Peter. You know, it's sort of this whole thing, isn't it? That uh, it's not first to the front uh, at all. I, th I think, but you, we don't require somebody to test something that's been tested again and again and again uh, and then get every country you know exactly the same there's nothing more unfair than the equal treatment of an equals and that's that's what goes on there that everybody you can't live life like that you've got to do what's in front of you straight away and get it done you know this has been this frustration with this government i've had um yeah. i think they've done all right um uh, don't think it's funny what's going on at the moment. I think it's a waste of time. Um, and no matter what happens, uh, the present prime minister, because you've got to remember that, that you know, a prime minister is very different from, well, once again, there's a British thing, isn't it? A prime minister, uh, a British thing, a queen, um, you know, versus a president, that kind of stuff. Um, British, I don't think would put up with that. I don't think they would put up with either Biden or with, with um, certainly no. not Trump. We prefer somebody in a little a little terraced house with some quite expensive wallpaper, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Jeff, just wanted to touch touch on um, just wanted to touch on the point that David and Mark were making before. And I think Mark is exactly right. There's no one's you know probably that interested in um, some of these local elections, or certainly the effect of it. You probably won't see. But on a on a bigger scale, Jeff, if and you've lived obviously you know you know Scotland very very well, far better than probably we do. Um, if the SNP do very well and and there is more clamour for for an independent Scotland, that must be the kind of thing that would prey on your mind a bit in terms of where 
markets and um, your strategy around the portfolio. Is that right? Well, it, 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 it plays into to thinking around what it may or may not mean. So I think if we if we take a step back, and you're right, the most recent poll does suggest that actually support has swung the other way, although it's marginally, it's, it's back below 50% for independence. But I think as we see, and the most likely projections suggest a, a large majority for the SNP, that will certainly increase the clamour for a referendum. But that referendum has to be granted by by by, by Parliament. So that in itself will, will cause some, I, I suppose, debate as to whether that is going to be granted. What it does then is make people think about, well, there's a degree of uncertainty. What what might that mean? Where do you see that impact the most? You probably see it a little bit in, in, in currency markets. And, and that's kind of what's viewed as the the outside risk for, for sterling. So we've seen sterling strengthen quite materially over the past number of months from the, the, the Brexit sort of lows. Let's get back to close to that 140 level against the dollar, strengthened against the euro as well. So that it's seen as a, as a risk factor. Why is it seen as a risk factor? Because of how it would have to be funded. So if we think about what it would mean for um, the, the, the Scottish economy, and this speaks to one of David's points there about this sort of looking back in history and thinking about the importance of, of oil and gas. Well, yes, 1980s, early 1990s, oil and gas was important. But actually, if we, we take a, a look at the breakdown of, of GDP and the contribution of it today, it's actually quite a de minimis amount. So if we look at Scottish GDP, say about seven and a half, eight percent of the UK's overall GDP, about 0.5 of a percent of that is is oil. So really, it, it it it's a it's the wrong argument to be to be making from the you know that the the economy will benefit from that it won't. And the other side of that is if we're looking forward, and we're thinking about um, how climate change those things are out there, we know that the intensity of oil use will decline. There will be then who's who's going to pay the costs of of decommissioning all these facilities etc. How's that going to be to be worked out? If you think then about the tax contribution in the for, of the overall, yeah, oil and gas was a big tax take for for the UK government in 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 the 80s and 90s. It's not today. It's a very very small proportion of the overall income. So there's those those dynamics that are at play, and then there's also at play, well, how do you share out the debt levels? So if you put that into the mix and you think about well. Fiscal deficit in the UK is probably about 2% today. If you do the same maths and you apply it sort of on the basis of population to, to Scotland, you end up with a, a fiscal deficit of some 10% and debt to GDP well over 100, all things that a market does not like. So that is, that's the challenge to me. Taking If you try and put the, the politics to the side, look at the facts, Think about how one would fund exactly as a business would do. How will we fund ourselves sustainably going forward? And and that is the is the question to to my mind at the at the heart of the debate. But that's maybe not the the debate. That's the the political debate. It goes back to that scoring scoring points between yeah. between one another. Well, let's well let's talk about that debate now then a little bit, Jeff. I, that looks like some pretty expensive wallpaper you've got behind you there, Jeff, on those walls. Where, where do you get that from? Uh, no idea. I'll have to go and see what Mrs. C says, but probably well, B and Q or somewhere like that. That's no, awesome. I, I oh, see, there you go. Me. There you go. That's a political answer. You focus group that you thought if I say B and Q on the podcast, I'll go down well with yeah. the masses. That's it. I saw that one coming. I, I think that Daniel. wallpaper, that wallpaper in Scotland, that wallpaper comes from a, a shop in Scotland called Jock Lewis. <laughs> 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 or Jimmy Lewis. <laughs> Okay, Lewis. Oh, oh. We, could go on, but we could go on, but we definitely shouldn't. No, um, no. Dan Daniel. We are, Peter. We're, you know, we are only a short distance from Scotland, and David's the closest. So if anybody doesn't like those comments, they're going to call on David first and then head down to us. That's okay with me, Mark. As long as I'm <laughs> Todd, yeah. um, Daniel, I wanted to talk to you about some of the stuff that's been in the news this week. So the, it is the the whole political carry on um, that we can't seem to get off the news, whether it's 
who's asking what questions, who's paying for which curtains, or um, or whatever it is this week. And do you think it does it? Do you think it makes us look a bit silly as a country? Because I do. Yeah, a hundred percent, Peter. I think it's a. It makes us look silly as a country. I think it makes the prime minister look silly as well. I think it just falls right in the hands of people who call politicians that they're in it for themselves, that they've got their hand in the till. But whatever whatever has gone on, and it seems that he has had his hand in the till, what a stupid thing to do, frankly. Uh, and also, when you look at some of the pictures of the flat, what a stupid thing to allow to happen. It looks awful. You know, it, 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 I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, I'm no... I don't even know what you call that guy, that Lawrence Llewellyn Boland, that, that interior design chap. Um, I'm, I'm not Lawrence Llewellyn Boland, but I know what looks okay and I know what looks bad. And that looks like someone's been, someone's gone to Sloan Square and been sick all over <laughs> down the street. So it does make us look silly, Peter. I think it it plays, it just plays in the hands. And then you've got Keir Starmer wandering around John Lewis, t- pretending to be like, a normal man, you know, there's nothing normal about you either, mate. So don't pretend to, <laughs> to, to be a man of the people either. You know, it's just, yeah, get on with proper things. Let's be serious for one's country. You know, it, it, there's, yeah. there's a lot to be happy about right now. There's a lot of actually, a lot of good things going on and this just detracts from it. Yeah, no, I agree. No wonder people have got so little time for politicians. And then the other one, of course, was Dominic Cummings decided to use t- time his a uh, little uh, re-emergence onto the scene this last week, no well, doubt in the run-up to some elections. Um, well, to, to the do, do, Dominic's NDA has probably run out as well. He probably got a three-month, four-month <laughs> payout. So he sat on that, got it, and now it's time to unlock the, the, the locker of secrets as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, the next one to watch out for there is he's, he's, in, front of a, he's in front of a committee in Parliament next month. Um, so, no, so I suspect he's either going to drop a few... I mean, it's awful, but he's either going to drop a few more in next week or he'll save it up for a um, proper, proper go when he's in front yeah. of the MPs. But it is, it is just, I just think, it, I think somebody other than you or David or Mark mentioned it, but um, it isn't something which appears to be, if you like, cutting through on the doorstep to use another horrible phrase on the news. But, it, you know, people just seem to be thinking, well, look, I don't really understand it. It's all a load of carry on. It's just the usual silly Westminster bubble mess. I think it makes the country look stupid. I think it makes politicians look stupid. But for the majority of the public, I just think I think they think it's silly versus anything else. Why are we even bothering talking about it? Yeah, it's, yeah, it it's draining as well, though. It, it's it's distracting yeah. from, from actually what, what's important. And with Cummins, nobody should be surprised. This was a man who you, you brought in. You know, love him or hate him. But you, you brought a man in who was different, who had an opinion, who wanted to cut through a lot of that. And he was fine until Boris's missus didn't like him and got him kicked out, if you believe some of the rumours. So, you know, of course that man is going to come back and get his revenge. And this was a, a bloke who was incredibly close to to the prime minister in the inner circle. So and he, he has all of those has it all there, and he's been publicly embarrassed with the way he got sacked and thrown out. Um, so, of course, he's going to come back. But it's yeah. distracting. It wastes, you know, Prime Minister's questions the other day was all about his flat. That's not the purpose of Prime Minister's questions. It's to call the Prime Minister into account about the way he's governing the country and what's coming next with your strategy. You know, so it is. It's. It's. I hate it. It's It's silly politics. It's... It, it, Rubbish. Uh, I, I agree, Danny. The, the trivial nature of the attacks, it's a waste of Prime Minister's question time. If that's the best thing you can come up with, yeah. right, don't bother. Don't bother at all. Just come up with, so ask him Ask him about the football last night or whatever. You know, it, it has as much relevance to the running of this country than... Uh, well, on, 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 on the football thing, they all managed to chime in on the football as well. You did yeah, yeah. You don't know what football is. You refer to it as soccer. So, so let's 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 not pretend to be a man of the people with that one either. You know. Yeah. yeah. They're all rugger boys, Dan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You Jordies don't know what football is either. Look, look how's your team's getting on. <laughs> at least at least we've got a manager. At the yeah. <laughs> no. At least at least we at least we didn't take our bat and ball and try and go to somewhere else. 
Um, <laughs> there was, I'll tell you what, there was one thing that struck me the other day when it's not going your way, but I think it, just on that point about Boris and Button his team, cricket. I, I, do, I don't think Boris has got a good team around. I don't think he's got any team around him. Um, if you look back, it's Theresa, Cameron, Blair Brown, they all had their teams of, of people. And often people say, why did they need all these advisors? And I think Boris has got nobody apart from his girlfriend. And it shows because the other day, I think it was earlier this week or was at the back end of last week, he went down to Dorset or somewhere like that and ended up in a field full of cows. And if you have a field full of cows, you, you also have a field full of something else that, cow, mm -hmm. that comes out of cows, which is, you know, if you're trying to give the newspapers, not that you should worry too much about that, I suppose, but if you, you just know how that ends up, which is Boris surrounded by you know what. And you just need someone to say, look, it's probably not the day to go to a cow field. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but, he, but you just, can, you know, there, we, it, I think it's great when you can sense Peter's frustration, can't you, about, you know, with his background, <laughs> look, looking after politicians and looking after these, these people, keeping them, keeping them out of the SH1C. Um, yeah. But it, 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 I would agree, once again, I agree with Daniel um, regarding Dominic Cummins, uh, I, I'd, I've never met the fellow, and uh, I think he's made one mistake, which was to be foolish enough to to uh, not work on the group, the the prime minister way back early doors, and to say, look, the queen, the prime minister, members of the government aren't the same as us, rather than pretend in like a populist kind of fairy tale that they they should be the same. Of course they shouldn't be the same. They're running a country. You know, once they realized that, that this was quite a um a dangerous disease, um, then they should have been allowed to travel and do whatever they need to run the country. And if if they just thought about that instead of doing the populist thing of saying I'm the same as everybody, you know, and of course that was a that was a classic error in, in, in a couple of ways. Yes, you're the same as everybody. Matt Hancock, in charge of keeping people healthy, catches a virus. Well, that's not very clever, is it? Really. It's like an electrician getting an electric shock. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just stupid. You shouldn't be mixing with people like that. Boris got it and nearly snuck them. You know, that wasn't very clever either. That's, that's, now, that's not being heroic. Well, that's like the Queen going in, in the war against Nazi Germany. She'd probably get killed. In fact, she would be a magnet, wouldn't she, for just about everything that's going on. All the bullets coming out. That's the last thing you need is somebody, an officer next to you when you're wandering around. You know, the, a sniper's going to get him and, and you and everybody else. So the whole whole thing, Dominic could have saved himself the embarrassment of getting caught and pretending that he's going for He's testing his driving ability when he's just having the day out, really. Um, and that was the beginning, unfortunately, end of, who, of a person who's certainly different. Now, I don't necessarily think he's brilliant. I think brilliance has got to do with you have to communicate with people. So no matter what you're really thinking, to set yourself up as an oddball and say, can I have some more oddballs and this and that? That's not, you, you, you need bright people. Oddballs are bright people. You know, um, so I, I think but there's another thing here. You never wound something, right? Either kill it or leave it alone. But when you wound something, it'll come back at you. Now, worse than that, if you wound something, you then go and poke it again by trying to blame it on some leaks or whatever. Good grief, he's been waiting for that. You know, so you're quite right, Peter. Whoever is not really helping the Prime Minister right now in, he, in his inner circle. They are now pretty dumb. They, they poke that guy for him to come out with all of this stuff. Um, and because he's been prompted to come out with it, because he's defending himself now, you know, if he just left it alone, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with, I mean, taste and more people. Look, he might as well move Kia and his lot in with him and carry and all this. This is he doesn't understand. He really doesn't understand. Right? But this is what the British public hate. They hate that London circle of, of I don't know, dinner-eating, chatty 
sort of people who read the circus. Guardian. Circus. It's just that that inner circle of rubbish, you know, it damages Britain more than this. And the only reason you hear from it is their best friends are Robert Peston and people like this. So, they, you know, give us some more gossip to talk about. Ha ha. It doesn't really mean anything. That would destroy most people. Boris isn't bothered about it. You know, he, you know, what's he done? Well, he's he's asked for a sub. He's got no money. We know he's got no money. He's got to write books. He's asked for a sub to do his flat up because his girlfriend thinks we that needs to be brightened up. Well, you know, don't go to Sloan Square. Just vomit on the walls. That's what it looks like. It looks ridiculous. It looks like something a, a habitat catalogue from the 1970s. It's somebody trying to be trendy, right? And you don't, you either are stylish or you're not. Look at Boris. He's not really stylish, is he? Right? But people like him for that. What they like about Boris is the realism. They can see that he makes big mistakes, but he's actually got balls. He actually pushes on. Keir Starmer doesn't, and Corbyn doesn't. You know, Keir Starmer's, who, who, I mean, the good news from the Tory point of view, uh, for you Tories out there, is the Labour people must have equally bad advisors, mustn't they? So they see this and go, I tell you what, Sir Kerr, this would be a good idea. Let's go down to John Lewis and see you looking at some wallpaper. Yeah. And any political point of view score is completely destroyed by saying, here is a bloke who's so completely out of touch that he thinks that that's going to score him political points. Do you, think he's going a, into a, do you think Keir Starmer will be going back to a pub this weekend, David, or a beer garden or something? I mean, he didn't have a great experience last time he popped into a pub in Bath, did he? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I, t- I don't know what you thought was going to happen there. Wait, but, in, you know, he should have, he should, I don't know where, where they can go. Maybe Hartlepool might be okay for them or might not. Um, I don't know where. He, he doesn't look like, he, he looks like the kind of guy that might go to the might go to the pub, but he'll tell people I've been to the pub. You know, it makes them so many drinks in Gosford High Street or somewhere like that. You know, no, Jesmond High Street. I, I, let's go down to the pub. Um, Daniel will know, when, you know, in Pontilan, some of the pubs in Pontilan where you got well, that, but you, you, but, you, you're but, rubbing shoulders with some... the, Before you put me in the crossfire, Peter's staying quiet there. Peter's been known to drink on Gosford High Street as well. <laughs> yes. Well, right. Well, it's. Well, if we're on about pubs, I've not been known to own a pub, but somebody around here has been. So we can, if you really want to go down this, if you really want to go down that road, we just let's just crack on. Um, I, I used to have bouncers in my pub. It used to you had to pay to get out of the pub. Uh, that was the thing. You, after you had the it was such good fun, you had to pay to get out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, look, I think we've talked about the British economy. We've talked about what's great about Britain and what's less great about Britain and what, frankly, embarrasses Britain. So that's a good, uh, I think we've covered all bases today. But we're heading into something else, which is British, which is a bank holiday weekend. So I'm going to wrap, begin to wrap this up by asking you, Mark, what you're doing this bank holiday weekend. And don't lie. Tell me if you're going to be having a, having a Domino's in a beer garden. I think that's what David meant, a Domino's. Or did he mean playing Domino's? I don't know what you meant earlier. But what are you doing, Mark, this weekend? Uh, Peter, I think the, it's going to be typical bank holiday weather, you know, so in the north east it'll be t-shirts in the rain and the cold, drinking as much as you possibly can. Um, but, you know, I think there's there's a lot to be done this weekend, Peter, and one thing we missed to, to say today is that the, the, the article that we're sending out from the investment management firm is all about the UK, and it's exactly the opposite of what's been said in the press. We talk about optimism, opening up. Stronger growth, lower unemployment, and vaccine levels within the UK compared to the rest of the world. So that's a good read for everybody who might be um, a little bit unhappy with what they're picking up from the, the mainstream press. So, so have a look at that. Other than that, um, we've got we've got football this weekend, Peter. You know, um, Steve Bruce will lead his merry band no, against Arsenal, no, against North London's <laughs> Arsenal. So. Hopefully we will pick up three points, which will see uh, Premiership safety for them. Um, another thing we'll do, Peter, on the, on the car on the way in, we were listening to the first or the latest episode of Bob Mortimer and Andy Dawson's Athletical Mints, and it's got a feature on there called uh, Geordie Heat. 
where Steve Bruce is leading the, the local constabulary <laughs> against the, against arch criminals. Um, so uh, that's, that's, that's for, for, for those who don't know, and we were talking earlier about what makes Britain great. You've got two Northeast comedians there. One of them's a smoggy from Middlesbrough, as in Mr. Mortimer. The other one's a magum, and they're having a go at people on Tyneside, which is a bit rich, but never mind. I'm trying to listen for the second half of that over the weekend. Mark, Steve Bruce could have put could have put his notice in the Newcastle and stood in the Crime, crime Commissioner election, then he could have brought that to reality, couldn't he? <laughs> you might do a more relevant job, Peter. Jeff, let, let, tell us about your weekend. What have you got? What have we got planned? Well, we're slightly behind in the, the reopening here, so we only reopened um, with outdoor pubs and restaurants and stuff like that at the beginning of this week. So we're going to head out for some food and and a couple of beers, which will be a nice change after having been been locked up for so long. So looking forward to that over the weekend. Good. Daniel, don't pretend you're not going to be out in Ponty Land this weekend, because I know you are. I can't, you can't get a table, Peter. Every table is booked solid. What do you, what do you want a table for? You want a pint, man? What's the point of a table? <laughs> <laughs> it's a pint you want. <laughs> today, talking talk about silly humour, like Mark was saying, Alan, the new series of Alan Partridge is on tonight at 9.30 at this time, so I'll be, I'll be watching that. Um, that, that that's, that's always good for, for work because there's so many silly things he says. It actually it trans, it transcends quite nicely in the workplace. <laughs> now we can pick up pick up some new Alan Partridge-isms. And then <laughs> after that, Peter, I, I, I don't know. I think, as Mark said as well, the, the other great British thing is you can always rely on a bank holiday to bring across stinking weather. And yeah. it's going to be cold, cold, wet and grey here. So, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sit in the house. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> well, have, have a great weekend anyway. Uh, enjoy that. You know, it just shows how daft people are these days, or maybe it's just me, but I did, you're right, Daniel, I did go for a pint outside last, last weekend. And there was meeting a few friends there. I got there first. And you think, well, I'm now sat on an outdoors table. And actually, it was lovely weather last Sunday. Got a bit sunburned. Um, and I'm, I was about 10 minutes early. So what do you do? You know, what, what are you going to do? Everyone else is on groups of four or five or whatever and having a great time. And I did that thing that only somebody who now nowadays would do is you get your phone out and you take a photo of your pint. Because <laughs> <laughs> what else are you going to do with it? But I think that looks quite nice, actually. It's making me quite thirsty. But anyway... I, I I like the way, Peter, you said you, you, you were a little bit sunburned. I saw you on Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit is an understatement. I think yeah, the yeah. thing, Dan, is, is that some people have pictures of their family on the screensaver on their phones. Peter's got his pint. That's a picture of Peter's best friend. <laughs> yeah. the, 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 only, the only friend you need. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting my uh, I'm getting my second uh, job or jag as they would call it in uh, they call it getting a jag in Scotland, uh, Jeff. You might you might be up on that. You might think you're going to buy a car and then somebody sticks a needle in your arm. But the um, so I'm getting my second uh, second ja job um, tomorrow. Um, so hope for the boys. I didn't I didn't yeah. Um, I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for Britain. And I'm, I'm actually doing it to help the heroes. I just hope that hero puts it in my arm, not my eye, or something like this. It's, uh, it, was, it, was a, it, was a it was a nice process uh, yesterday. But what makes Britain great, right? We, we mentioned that before. And I mean, the vaccine program um, is the thing of getting on with things, using a bit of nous and using a bit of inventiveness to get enough of the vaccines to service the population and not just not the funny on and and uh, uh, clot about with it but get it into people's arms as quickly as possible and we've done that really really well um and uh you know we should we should learn from that we should i mean this is the the thing as a business i know daniel and jeff and mark would do this when something goes well they really work out what the hell they've done because it might be accidental, but you work and you build on that. I mean, don't just focus on constantly, which is what the press do, the negative. The positive there, there's some lessons to be learned from the way that we adopted vaccines and got them out there 
uh, and learn from. And, and we should. The reason I mentioned rules, we need to get rid of these rules. Regulators and lawyers and others who, in the main, people politics and um, have a, a big impact on the way the media act as well, would have us living with these kind of rules and passports and other things forever. It's not this. This is, you know, a minor a thing. It's not minor if you got killed, but it's minor in terms of the effect it's had on the population, uh, the amount of deaths. Very, very small in comparison to, say, Spanish flu or whatever. Um, so, you know, we, we do need to get on um, and learn from what we've done well here, which is anybody can give you an injection. Let's just get in, get it done. That's it. And you feel, and this was a discovery now, of course, it has a dramatic effect on you maybe passing it on. You know, there's less chance you'd be passing it on, never mind you not getting it, which has always been the key, isn't it? This, this is the point with it. So yeah. I think uh, for the weekend, I, it, this is like any weekend for me. I, I think, you, you know, I wouldn't say every day is a holiday because every day isn't every day I tend to work. But because... in Scotland, it's, it's, it's still too chilly to be wearing the kilt. That's the thing. <laughs> the, they're looking forward to, to doing that wearing a kilt. So Jeff I, 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 I might, might get my kilt on at the weekend then to celebrate. I, I think I think I think you should, you know. Nicholas let you out, you know, he been a good boy. Well Jeff, Jeff, that sounded like a that sounded like an invitation. You could put it on, you could get it on right now if you want. But please don't. Good. Uh, <laughs> on, that, on, on that note, I think we'll uh, we'll begin to wrap this up then. So thank you everyone. That was a, an interesting discussion there about there about the best of the best of British. So, uh, and we had the best of British on the podcast as well. So, thanks very much uh, to Jeff, Mark, David, and Daniel. Thanks to you as well for tuning in to this week's True Potential Do More With Your Money podcast. As I said earlier, just do subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll, you'll catch the next one and the one after that and all that have gone before as well. So, thanks for watching. And until the next time, it's bye for now. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Subscribing to True Potential YouTube channel is quick and easy. Simply go to your YouTube app on your phone, type in True Potential and press the red subscribe option. You'll then be notified as and when new videos are released.